The UFC has a huge problem right now. And one of the most, you know, kind of forgotten traits of a UFC fighter, one of the most forgotten traits of a UFC champion is to have a great personality. The UFC has a superstar problem. When you look at the superstars around the UFC, there's maybe two, maybe three guys that you can look at currently. And when you look around the current and the future landscape of the UFC, you see names like Umar Namagamedov, you see Shavkat Rachmanov, you see Magomed Ankalaev, and not even just going off people that don't speak English as their first language, because you even look at Bilal Muhammad, Leon Edwards, Bo Nickel. None of those guys have great personalities. None of those guys I could look at and say that they're a superstar or have superstar potential. So where are we going to see the superstars in the UFC? Who are the current superstars? And that's what we're getting into today. We're getting into the biggest personality, the best personality, and the biggest superstar in every single division. But before we get into it, make sure to like, subs, all that YouTube shit. It truly, truly does help me out a ton. Your one like will push out to 100 more people with the click of a button. And also subscribe because there's only like, what, 25, 30% of people that watch my videos that are actually subscribed. Let's get into it though. Starting off, we're going to start off with that 125 pound division and the 125 pound division. This one might be a little bit of a hot take because you look around 125 and 125 is craving a superstar. It's craving somebody that can, you know, stand out from the crowd. Somebody that can draw eyes to that 125 pound division. And who do I think the guy's going to be? It's Kai Asakura. It's the guy that's just came into the UFC, and it's a lot of pressure. It's a big tag to put on his name when I don't even really think he's going to be Pantoja. I'm not even really sure if he's going to become a UFC champion, but he has everything that you need to become a superstar in the UFC. What's people's kind of biggest complaint around that 125 pound division? Everybody knows how skillful it is. Everybody knows how good the fighters are. It's that there's no knockouts. There's no KOs of that 125 pound division. It's very rare that you see a finish. You look back at, you know, all of the title fights we've had. You look at Brandon Moreno's reign. You look at, you know, Figgy's reign. You look at even Pantoja's reign. There's not a lot of finishes. And if there is any finishes, 99% of the time, they're going to be submissions. So that is people's biggest problem. And what can Kaya Sakura provide you? What can Kaya Sakura definitely give you? It is KO power. The guy is a natural born finisher. And when you look at him at 125, he's a huge 125er, like a very big 125er. I saw him sparring Merab Valashvili, some footage of that. He looks like a 45er sparring Merab. So he could potentially dominate that 125 pound division. And he draws in that kind of Japanese market, that Asian market that we haven't seen before. And he could transition into one of the biggest superstars inside the UFC. After that, we have the 135 pound division. Some people aren't going to agree. Some people are not going to agree with this. Some people don't like, I say this pretty often and some people just disagree. It's Sean O'Malley. It has to be Sean O'Malley. One of the biggest things that you have to do to become a superstar inside the UFC, to, you know, kind of transcend that UFC fan base. Because to the UFC, if you ask like a UFC fan, someone who watches every event, someone who's watching finance, someone who's watching prelims, who the biggest superstars in the UFC are, they're probably going to go along the lines, you know, Islam Makachev's probably going to be in there. Then you look at obviously Alex Pereira, you look at Tom Aspinall, but those guys are not the biggest superstars when you ask a casual fan. Go up to a casual fan and ask them who Islam Makachev is. Go up to a casual fan and ask them, do you know, name Islam Makachev's last three fights or who Tom Aspinall is. They're not going to know these guys. They're not going to know the best of the best inside the UFC because they have not transcended that market. What has Sean O'Malley done? Sean O'Malley has a thousand percent transcended the just hardcore UFC fans. He's almost more popular with general people. He's more popular with the casual fan than he is with the hardcore fans. So Sean O'Malley, it has to be him. It has to be him. And he's done really well to link himself in with, you know, all those YouTubers, all the YouTubers all turn up to his fights. And he gets that kind of push, that kind of influence from people outside of the UFC to make him a superstar. But 135 it has to be Sean O'Malley. People have their grievances with him, but he has a super fun fight style. If we're talking about KO power. He has, you know, unbelievable KO power. And he obviously has that push from everybody outside the hardcore fan space. After that, we have 145, and the 145 pound guy is also the champion. It's Ilya Teporia. It has to be Ilya Teporia here. He has unbelievable superstar potential. When you look at Ilya Teporia, okay, Spanish speaking, which reaches out to an audience that you don't typically have. Obviously, you have like Portuguese with the Brazilians, but not that many Spanish speaking champions. And Ilya Teporia like everything that he can do, because he can talk shit pretty well in English too, can talk shit really well in Spanish, but can talk shit pretty well in English, manages to call a shot in a kind of Conor McGregor-esque thing. 
And I know that people are going to say, oh yeah, well, he's just copying Conor McGregor. Like, how are you going to have this Conor McGregor copycat as one of the biggest superstars inside the UFC? But I think he's going to lean away from that bit by bit by bit by bit. We see a lot of fighters come in and get that comparison. Sean O'Malley comes in with that comparison. You look at obviously Ian Gary because he's Irish comes in with that comparison and they kind of lean on it a little bit. But the older that they get, the more that they push away. And we've seen that a little bit more. If you've been watching the build up between Ilya Teporia and Max Holloway, he's kind of transitioned into more trying to have Ilya Teporia's his lines and get away from those Conor McGregor comparisons. And he's box office. He's box office every single fight. He's one of those guys that you just, you can't look away for a single second because it is one shot. He has one punch KO power, without a doubt. One punch KO power can put your lights out. Even when you see him working on like the heavy bag, the difference in just how much oomph, how much twerk he gets on his punches, how fucking powerful everything is, is crazy. Is absolutely crazy. He's a phenomenal boxer. Also has really, really good jujitsu and wrestling. But he's almost one of the guys on this list that I think is going to be a superstar for the next five or six years. Decent on the mic, not perfect. There is some things to be worked out, but decent on the mic. Appeals to a whole new audience. Super fun fight style. It's hard to say anybody that is not Ilya Teporia. After that, we have 155. I was talking about Islam Makachev in the intro because I truly think that Islam Makachev is someone that's underrated by the casual fan, but like every hardcore fan knows how good he is. There's a reason that like he can still sell pay-per-views because he's so good. He is the pound for pound number one that everybody that even has a slight inkling of the UFC, like it's just like any chance that Islam Makachev gets, any fight that he has, I'm watching, I'm locked in, of course. But the guy that's reached out to the casual fan base, the guy that has the potential, if he can become a UFC champion, if he can become a top five UFC fighter to eclipse anything that Islam Makachev's ever been close to, is Paddy Pimblett. Paddy Pimblett. I don't know how the fuck he got his fans, to be honest with you. Like, I kind of understand it. Dynamic personality, can talk shit. Really good on the mic, which is a skill that I was talking about that people have forgotten inside the UFC. He's really good on the mic. But, like, what does he do that well? It's like, when you look at him as a fighter, Ron O'Malley had, like, one-punch KO power, and that's why he was, you know, so popular. Paddy Pimblett is like the opposite to what you think would be a super popular guy. You know, jiu-jitsu heavy, wrestling heavy, is decent on the feet, but not great. But Paddy Pimblett has such a backing inside England, inside Liverpool, even like towards Ireland, it's not too bad. And even in America, Americans love Paddy Pimblett for some reason. But he he's the superstar of that 155 pound division. The push that he's going to get is going to be insane. He's going to get a Sean O'Malley type push, you know what I mean? Where who knows who he's going to get. If he gets a belt at 55, they're going to give him the worst guys they can give him for defenses. They're going to have me in there fucking defending against Paddy Pimblett just to try increase his star power bit by bit by bit. And he is captivating. He does, you know, kind of have whatever it is. Paddy Pimblett has it. When you watch him walk out in London and when you watch him, you know, walk out in the US, he captivates that entire crowd to a point that we don't really see that often inside the UFC. So he's really good on the mic. If he can just get his fighting level to a high level and he's top 15 and we've seen him look really, really good against Bobby Green. But if he can get to that top 10, top five status, he's going to be one of the biggest 155 superstars ever. Ever. And I know some people are going to have wanted me to say, you know, Charles, Dustin, all of those different guys. But for me, the way that I've done this list is it's going from like if they were to fight tomorrow or in the future. So you're not going to see a guy like John Jones down here. Because although John Jones is one of the biggest superstars inside the UFC, it's kind of stuff he's done in the past. So I'm more looking into, you know, like the present right now and looking a little bit into the future too to look at who the future superstars of the UFC are. After that, we have that 170 pound division. The 170 pound division, there's only one name that I can put down here. And it's different to everybody else. Everybody else I've talked about on this list. You have Kaya Sakura, Sean O'Malley, Ilya Teporia, KO Power, Paddy Pimblett just has whatever it is. Paddy Pimblett has it. Now we're getting into the heels. The heels do just as well, if not better, than what the guys that people love are. Hate is more powerful than love, especially when it comes to fighters, especially when it comes to fighting. You look at how much Floyd Mayweather got paid just because people wanted to see him lose. You look at kind of Bilal Muhammad. A lot of people hate on Bilal Muhammad and a lot of people are going to be watching his next fight. A lot of people were watching his fight with Leon Edwards. I'd say the Raquel Pennington numbers for the first round before people actually got put to sleep. I'd say that Raquel Pennington fight's numbers weren't actually looking too bad. And who is the biggest heel at that 170 pound division? It's Ian Gary. It's Ian Gary a thousand percent. One of the most hated fighters inside the UFC. And I can understand why. 
I'm not even sure he does it on purpose. He might be the greatest heel in history. Because once you get to, you know, kind of where I am, like you're 20 years old, that kind of, you know, Colby Covington actor, once you've watched a lot of mixed martial arts, that Colby Covington act, we know that's not who Colby Covington truly is. When you look at Chael Sonnen, and Chael Sonnen is one of the greatest trash talkers of all time, but we know that's not who Chael Sonnen really is. We know most of it is an act. With Ian Carey, I don't know. I actually do not know if he's acting or not. I do know if the shit that he does, he knows people are going to push back at. He knows people are going to be angry at. Or if he just doesn't know that, if he's just like that kind of stupid. But my God, does he have people riled up for his fight weeks. My God, did he have people angry after he beat MVP and out-wrestled MVP, after he did all the shit with his girlfriend that he didn't. Some of the stuff is really, really weird. Some of the stuff would turn you away from me and Gary. But he is box office for, you know, those heel reasons. People are going to want to see Ian Gary lose, especially because he's undefeated. If he leans into mocking Conor McGregor a little bit more, Ian Gary could be the biggest heel in UFC history. Like, he has the type of hate that you rarely, rarely ever see actual hate from UFC fans. And Ian Gary is a future superstar. He's a potential superstar because he has all the skills too. He has all of the skills to become a UFC champion, a UFC double champion. He has the striking. We've seen that his wrestling is improving. Ian Gary's the guy at 170. I feel like there can be no arguments. After that, we have 185. This guy's kind of on his last shot for me. He's on his last shot. He might be one of the fighters that has the most pressure inside the UFC, and that is Hamza Chemaev. Hamza Chemaev, if you said three years ago or four years ago when he first originally came into the UFC around those COVID times, like if you said that he wasn't a double champ, number one pound for pound, biggest superstar in the UFC right now, people would have called you crazy. The hype around Hamza Chemaev was something else. It was unbelievable for the shit that he was doing. But I think now, even though he is the biggest superstar at 185, and he is, Dana knows it. Obviously, he has that Saudi background too, so the Saudis love him. But Hamza Chemaev, if he loses to Robert Whitaker, I feel like his hype's going to go a little bit down the drain. But when we're talking about superstar potential, when we're talking about, you know, guys that are superstars in the UFC, guys that if they fight tomorrow are some of the biggest superstars in the UFC, Hamza Chemaev is a name that's known to anybody. Casual fans, hardcore fans, and probably even another guy that's known more by the casual fans. And for those first five minutes, Hamza Chemaev might be not only the most entertaining, not only the most scary, but the most dangerous fighter in the UFC. In those first five minutes, like you're comparing Hamza Chemaev and prime Conor McGregor. When we talk about those five minutes, you literally have Hamza Chemaev in the first five minutes because of obviously his grappling and his wrestling. He's going to be able to submit you and Conor McGregor in the first five minutes because Conor McGregor is probably knocking you out. And Hamza Chemaev, he's got such an intense backing. It's almost insane. It's like more than what Sean O'Malley ever had, where Hamza Chemaev has a close fight with Gilbert Burns. Who cares? You know, like, give him a title shot. Give him a title shot. Please give him a title shot. Okay, well, they're going to ride if you give him a title shot. Well, whatever. Move him up to 185. Give him Kamara Usman right away, okay? Give him Kamara Usman off the couch. As soon as he beats Kamara Usman, Dana White once again is talking about, because people kind of forget, Dana White said that that Usman Hamza Chemaev fight was a number one contender fight. That's what he said. He said when that fight happened that, you know, like that is a title eliminator fight. Whoever wins that fight is getting a title shot. And now we're seeing him against Robert Whitaker. And I can guarantee you, if he beats Robert Whitaker, he is without doubt getting a title shot. He is 1000% getting a title shot. So Hamza Chemaev, I'm not even sure if the casual fans love him that much. I know that hardcore fans, especially, I think he's one of the more overrated fighters inside the UFC. But Dana and them Saudis love him. So he's going to get that push. He's going to get every promo, every billboard, every, you know, fight night main event, every UFC pay-per-view co-main main event until he becomes a UFC champion. And that's almost more powerful than the public. If Dana loves you, we've seen that Dana White privilege comes in strong. After that, we have 205. For a lot of these divisions, I haven't picked the current undisputed champion and kind of picked out, you know, some of the guys that I think are on their way up or some of the guys that just have star power outside the UFC. For this, there's nobody else. 205 is one guy. It's Alex Pereira. And Alex Pereira has fundamentally changed how superstars are made inside the UFC. Legit, fundamentally changed how the UFC not only promotes guys, but how UFC fighters think that they need to become a superstar. And it's kind of for the better. I talked about that, you know, talking shit and being great on the mic is a quality that's lost in a lot of UFC fighters now. But I think it's one of those ones where if you can do it, do it. But there's nothing worse than watching someone trying to force it. How many guys have you looked at in the UFC where they're trying to force the shit talk and you're like, 
Bro, this is disgusting. Like, this is just terrible to watch, bro. Can you please stop talking shit? Like, you just cannot do it right at all. And Alex Pereira knew what he was, knew what he could do. And that's not talk shit, but that is knock people out. That is put on spectacular fights. And you can be a pretty good fighter, talk a good amount of shit, and get to that superstar level. Like, obviously, you have to be a championship level fighter. But if you're a champion and you put on pretty fun fights, and you're a good shit talker, you can become a superstar. But you can also go the other way. You can be a not great fighter, maybe top 15 fighter, be the greatest shit talker, have the greatest personality like we see with Paddy Pimlet, and become a superstar. Or you can go the Alex Pereira route, where you are not a shit talker at all. Bottom tier and shit talker. In terms of what we see from you in BMF shit, when we see you inside the cage, be absolutely top tier. And he's probably the biggest superstar inside the UFC nowadays. There's nobody that people kind of like to watch more than Alex Pereira. And if he wasn't at such a bum division, I feel like he'd be even more of a superstar. But for 205, it has to be Alex Pereira. Alex Pereira, the way that he carries himself, the kind of aura that he has, it's different. It's something different. It's something that I think we're not going to see in the UFC for a while and it's someone that people are going to, you know, make documentaries, make films about in the next few years. And then finally, we have 265. 265 is Tom Aspinall. It's Tom Aspinall. It has to be Tom Aspinall once again. The crazy thing about Tom Aspinall is that I feel like he's almost the most underpromoted guy inside the UFC. Tom Aspinall does not get that push from the UFC that pretty much everybody else in the UFC gets. Tom Aspinall does not get that kind of, you know, that Paddy Pimblet, that Sean O'Malley type push. And he really, really should. He should be one of the biggest superstars inside the UFC. He should be an easy headliner in any pay-per-view. He should easily be the guy that's going up against John Jones next. And for it to financially make sense, because that's one of the biggest things that I talk about when I talk about Jones and Aspal, but we're not getting into that today. But it should financially make sense. It should be one of the biggest UFC fights ever among casuals, among hardcore fans, among anything for Dana White. It should be a hundred million purse each type of fight, John Jones against Tom Aspinall. Because you have the greatest of all time and you have Tom Aspinall who is knocking everybody out inside a minute. Like I don't, I genuinely don't understand why they don't promote him. He went up against the scariest KO artist and Sergei Pavlovich. Knocked him out. Knocked out Curtis Blades, who was his only loss, and he lost that via injury. Has beat Alexander Volkov, finished Alexander Volkov. Like, the guy just does not not finish fights. He is a pure finisher, and he's decent on the mic. In my mind, it's almost like an Alex Pereira type thing, and he's better than what Alex Pereira is on the mic. I don't understand it. He's one of the most underpromoted fighters in UFC history. And maybe we see it when John Jones leaves and he gets the championship that the UFC are really going to start pushing him. But Tom Aspinall should not be able to leave his house. Like Tom Aspinall should not be able to go on holiday without being swarmed by people, without being swarmed by fans. And it seems like he could go down to his fucking local Tesco and probably wouldn't even get stopped. So I just don't understand. I don't understand why Tom Aspinall isn't the biggest superstar in the UFC today. But when we're talking about potential, he will be. He will be one of the biggest superstars UFC has ever seen, and I'm so sure of that. But that is the biggest superstar slash biggest personalities in the UFC today. Make sure to like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'll catch you boost tomorrow. Peace.